from the ground, but I'm not looking down. Feel the warmth of the breeze rushing over me. Now it's all in hand. Reach and touch the sky. and groundlings, lurkers and lovers. Welcome to Hang with Hillary. Come on, Dee Dee. Let's go hang with our co-host, David Maldo. David. Hey. That would be great to see you. This is, uh, this is so much fun already, like, like all of our shows. <laughs> the today's show is going to be so much fun. I named my dragon. Did you notice? I, her name is Dee Dee. So Dee Dee, my dragon. Dee Dee, my pet dragon. Oh my gosh, you guys. Perfect. Which in China means, uh, like, instead of Uber, they call for a Dee Dee. So I think I need to call for my Dee Dee. Oh, uh, so David's coming in. I know it looks like uh, we are sitting next to each other at, on the couch, but actually David has a very famous pair of legs. So um, welcome to those in the chat. So if anyone wants to guess whose legs David is borrowing today, um, um, we can reveal that. So I'm not sure. We're a little bit behind for the guesses, but let's go ahead and we'll reveal. David, whose legs are you borrowing for today? Is this, I think I'm Obama today, aren't I? You are Obama today because we all stand go. upon his legs in some way. So <laughs> I love that. All right, enough of the chit chat. If you are here because of our guest, uh, we have the our incredible Paul Racy is with us today from Sound of Metal, which we are thrilled about. Uh, we've got some incredible guests coming up next week. We've got Darius DeHaas, who is a Broadway star, actor, singer, dancer. He is also the voice of Shy Baldwin on The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. He sings for Shy. Uh, then on March 3rd, we've got the fabulous Rosalie Tim, who I'm so excited, and Hillary Back is on for March 10th from Sound of Metal. If you see all the little um, things in the night bot, you can, uh, uh, actually David taught me this, that if you type in exclamation point commands, you can see all the things that we've automated for you, such as our schedule, our Twitch, our Twitter, and different other links that he is, he puts in new things every week. So without, all our friends, our little night bot friends. So usually I bring, I read the bios first and then bring our guests on, but we're going to shake things up a little bit because I don't want to waste one minute more. And I want to bring out my friend, the fabulous, extraordinary Paul Racy. Welcome to the show, Paul. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Los Angeles. <laughs> We got an international crowd here. So, uh, for those five people who do not know who Paul Racy is, he is a multi award winning actor whose credits include Baskets opposite Zach Galifianakis, Goliath opposite Billy Bob Thornton, and Parks and Rec opposite Amy Poehler. But you can catch him right now in Sound of Metal on Amazon Prize for. Amazon Prize. I should say Amazon Prize because they're doing nothing but winning prizes. Amazon Prime, for which he won. Ready? Let's count them off. Best Supporting Actor uh, from the Boston Society of Film Critics, from the Independent Spirit Awards, from the Los Angeles Film Critics Association, from the National Board of Review, National Society of Film Critics, and many, 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 many more that are coming up. Uh, the time. So for those of you who don't know, Paul is the firstborn son of deaf parents 
which makes him a CODA, a child of deaf adults. Paul was drafted into the Vietnam War, joined the U.S. Navy, and did two combat tours on the USS Coral Sea as a hospital corpsman. And I'm glad I pronounced that right. Not corpsman, corpsman. Oh. <laughs> Much as I love Obama, he said <laughs> and got murdered for it. But anyway, go ahead. There were some corpses. So uh, he attended the University of Illinois on the GI Bill, where he fell in love with acting. And he was cast in countless productions in Chicago and has performed in dozens of productions with Deaf West Theater in Los Angeles. Paul is also the lead singer-signer for the Hands of Doom ASL Rock Band, which is a Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath tribute band. Paul is also a court-certified American Sign Language interpreter living in Los Angeles with his wife, Liz, and their daughter, Britta. Britta. So welcome to the show, Paul. <laughs> Easy, easy. Uh, you deserve that and all so much more. So um, we're going we're gonna to find out a little bit more about you. But first, we're going to roll some uh, footage for the Sound of Metal trailer, uh, which is at Amazon Prize. So, David, let's go on, head off into the screening room and show the good people a little bit of Sound of Metal. You sound great. Yeah, right. What? You're telling me you weren't feeling it? You were... Sorry, we're going to fast forward just because we don't, it's three minutes. I found a place. I think it's important that you stay here with us right now, Ruben. We're looking for a solution to, to this. Not this. I need you to wait for me. Okay, you're in for me. Lose my car, you're in for me. Okay, you gotta wait for me. does keep moving it can be a damn cruel place but those moments of stillness Let's go to the theater and have a little chat with Paul. We decided to talk in our happy place today, um, because both for Paul and myself, this is where we love talking. Paul, congratulations. Oh, yeah, thank you. I love looking at that clip. That's, that's Darius Mark is a great story. Great. So we've chatted before about uh this incredible rehearsal process that you did, and it was pretty unusual compared to um rehearsal processes for other films. So how long did you guys rehearse for and how is it different rehearsing for Sound of Metal than other films that you've done? Well, uh, <laughs> how do I answer that? Never really did any other films, Hillary. I, <laughs> I can't remember a time when I got a chance to do a whole role. I'll be honest with you, I'm tired of, I ain't gonna lie. I mean. How, what kind of rehearsal do you get when you're doing day player work? You get you get on set, they send you to your trailer, you look at your two lines like you're gonna forget them or something, start reading them, you know, and then you, you get your moment. And, but this was different. Um, I had a whole script. Uh, I What I remember about the rehearsal process is that there really wasn't that much of a rehearsal process because Darius and I just kind of talked about Joe. For example, the first scene that I had with Riz, that's the first time I met the guy. And wow. while I was there, I'm meeting the guy and life's unfolding while you're on the set. 
So, because we shot the, the movie uh, chronologically. So I was getting to know him on the set. Uh, and like, for example, the first scene we have, um, I, all I knew is that I, I had to be Joe very strong uh, and he was checking me out. And I was checking him out as, a, as like doing an intake at an addiction program. By the time we cut to about three weeks later, when we're doing our very last scene together, the stakes were a little bit heightened because we had gotten to be friends now. Just like Joe and Ruben got to be very close living in this uh, sober house. So our last scene together is really a, a goodbye scene on so many uh, different levels, you know. I'm seeing these questions come in in the chat. I am going to answer all of them, but I'm going to jump a little bit out of order because this pertains to what we were just talking about. So Katiana Romani like, wants to know, uh, do you feel like you were acting or do you feel you were just applying yourself to the script? Because Joe is very similar to who you are, but where where does the acting come in and how are you different than Joe? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. There's definitely acting going on here. <laughs> It's a craft. Yes. <laughs> it's a craft. And so, you know, you look at it this way. Uh, and I, Darius Martyr has talked about this, and I love this concept. Every actor, every individual, you know, David, yourself, um, Hillary, every actor has a garden that they pull from. Hmm. My, garden, my garden is about 40 years old as far as my career goes, you know. I'm in my 70s now, but I have a very deep garden of experiences. So if you're an actor, and I don't care how old you are, you could be, if you're 19 or 24 or 30, you have to pull from that garden. So yes, the script is very close to me. I have been writing a script, just like every gas station or 7-Eleven guy out here is writing a script that stars him. I was doing that too, you know. And then Darius wrote this role, which... Uh, is very close to my life experience, but that's my garden. And so when you're doing the craft of acting, and I'm used to doing it on a 99-seat theater in a black box, you know, that's that's where the real acting is, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, you pull from that garden. And I my garden happens to be very rich, if I don't mind saying so myself. <laughs> We're... Uh 40 years of experience. I mean, those credits, which is why I brought you on to read, that's just a portion of his bio, which goes on for pages, uh, which leads to the next question by my friend, Lynn-Ann McGrail, who wants to know what uh, your favorite scenes from the movie are. Do you have a favorite scene? Oh, uh, yeah. I, well, I do love the last scene, the last scene we have, of course. And that everybody, I love uh, going online, although I hate going online, but I like going <laughs> online to... Uh, Check out what people say. They refer to that scene as the scene. Or okay. somebody, some, I'll see, uh, somebody tweets out and goes, that scene, that, that scene. They talk about that scene. And it is the scene. Right. Uh, and as I said, it's a goodbye scene. You know, that day we shot that scene, you know, it was beautiful, sunny days. Every day, all three weeks out there, it's a beautiful, beautiful time of the year. And, um, the very last day we shot that scene, it started to rain. So it's really oh, no. foggy. Yeah, it was foggy, it was cloudy, it was drizzly, it was sad, it was somber. All the deaf ensemble, the deaf cast, had left the, the day before. They wrapped. So now it's just me and Liz left. Uh, Liz, that's my wife. Uh, <laughs> she was at home. But um, So now there's this Riz and I left. And so it was a little melancholy. It was a little sad. And we were saying goodbye to each other. I was saying goodbye to the whole set. Riz was saying, we were saying goodbye to this wonderful house that we got to shoot this movie in, which right. is an authentic farmhouse out there in Ipswich, uh, Maine, outside of Boston there. So I do like that scene. That's incredible. I, yeah, it is beautiful. I do like the scene where I'm telling him when he's fixing the roof and... Uh, I call on the carpet, you know, you have to fix anything. God, but there's so much, you know, it's this, this, he shot so much beautiful stuff. A lot of my favorite stuff isn't even in the movie. Stuff that we shot that was just so rich with these other deaf actors that is not in the movie. He could have had a four hour movie there, but then, you know, we'd all be, we'd still be in the theater right now watching this thing. 
which we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks when Hillary Bach is in uh, mm. uh, on Hanging with Hillary. So subscribe now so you can be reminded when she's oh, on. Hillary, yes, uh, Hillary Bach, wonderful deaf actor. Holy crap, what a talent. And she just, you know, didn't make the cut on a lot of things where she should have because she was wonderful. But, you know, he was, he's editing a movie. I'm sorry, folks. That's the way Hollywood is. He had to edit a movie to, to, to go from uh, the protagonist point of view, which is Ruben, the character of Riz. And um, that's the way it goes. A lot of my stuff's on the cutting room floor, too. But uh, not all of it. <laughs> Not all of it. You got a lot of gold on that screen, which brings me to uh, another friend, a deaf, fabulous deaf actress, uh, Ra Raquel McPeak Rodriguez, uh, wants to know what is next for you, Paul? Well, next for me is my second COVID shot that's coming up in about three weeks. Mazel well, tough. Congrats. <laughs> I was in five hours at Dodger Stadium last Saturday, along with my car, getting my COVID shot. Right now, uh, I'm, I'm looking at some some scripts. I'm turning down a couple just because I can. There's nothing going on right now. There's no production. So all I'm doing right now is I'm rehearsing with my band, uh, Hands of Doom, a Black Sabbath tribute band. Uh, love those guys. Uh, we're, we're recording something at the end of February. We're going into the studio. Everything's socially distanced. Nothing's happening here. So uh, wow. what's new? I'm just kind of waiting. And that's all right. Uh, now is the time, I think, to be reflective uh, for everybody. And just, you know, I'm, I'm cocked and ready to go right now. <laughs> well, fun. that's one of the incredible things of this business that people don't understand. I mean, you are being featured really heavily in the press right now. Like every day there's articles, there's social media. And the fact that you're still working your day job as being an interpreter, right? Yeah. Isn't that some? Everybody thinks I'm famous. Uh, listen, I didn't, I didn't buy my house. I have a house here in Burbank. I didn't buy the house making movies, doing action flicks and shit like that. I, didn't do, I was working in the court system as a sign language interpreter. I'm a certified sign language interpreter in the Los Angeles County Bakersfield, uh, you know, Kern County, Ventura County, uh, San Bernardino. And that's what I do. I'm doing a lot of it by Zoom. I do a lot of legal work. I'm, I'm certified with a legal certificate in interpreting. And so uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I was in court this morning. I wasn't on a movie set. So I'm waiting for uh, whatever happens now. And I'm not worried about it. Nobody's working right now. There's a, there's a couple of few things going on. I just saw Law and Order the other day where everybody's got masks on. It was kind of <laughs> Law and Order SUV wearing masks. Kind of cute. Oh, but okay. all right, I'm just kind of, I'm hanging. So well, that leads to a, a question from Jason Gaffney, who uh, he's a deaf filmmaker who um, does not work with interpreters, but is curious about what that is like. He wants to know, do you get to pick what kind of cases you work on as a sign language interpreter? Uh, yeah, well, you can, you can, you can choose to accept any assignment that you like, but then you have to know, there's a thing about interpreters, you should know when you're getting in over your head, you know, uh, something that you may not be able to handle when you get there. But as for me, interpreting in the court systems of Chicago and uh, Cook County and here in Los Angeles for the past, you know, 40 years, uh, I just take anything, any assignment they give me, I take it because I, there isn't anything I haven't seen. Um, when I get to a certain job, now, I, I don't know, I don't want to, when, when you get, uh, I'm glad there are deaf people in the audience because you'll understand this. Let's say I get to a job in court and I find out that uh, the deaf client that I have is language deprived, let's say, and uh, he's not really uh, uh, using ASL to the fullest benefit that he could to help himself out then I will call a certified deaf interpreter in to bridge that gap. That happens all the time. We have a heavy Hispanic population here. And if I have to call somebody in to make sure that communication is being facilitated between the court and this particular deaf client, then I have to let the, let the as an officer of the court, I have to let the court know so that we can arrange to have a postponement or continuance and get a deaf 
interpreter in there so that we can facilitate communication. So that's almost like, it's not turning down a, 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 an assignment, it's making sure that it's gonna be done the right way. And of course, if a deaf client in a court situation, even if it's a ticket, if they request a CDI, a certified deaf interpreter, then all bets are off. I just call the office, we get a continuance, the judge agrees to it, and we get a deaf person in there for the next um, continuance. It's complicated and it's something that you've been working on a long time. So, uh, but I want to go back to talk about uh, growing up in Chicago, doing theater in Chicago. Like you said, you've been at this for 40 years. So like what, what sort of work did you do um, like in your twenties and thirties and what sort of, what, what sort of plays or projects or shows did you do? Well, I had a uh, theater company in Chicago along with 10 other actors. It was called the Immediate Theater Company. And we, we modeled the, the company after a, a, a book written by Peter Brooks. He wrote, the, he wrote a book about theater called The Empty Space. Mm. His whole uh, philosophy was that theater, and I said this before, theater is where we have a didactic experience in a small space with a uh, hundred other people and you're, you're watching this thing unfold on a, on a stage. And he said, something sears in the mind. In other words, you know, it sears in the mind that you just can't forget. Like Children of a Lesser God, at the end of Children of a Lesser God, when the uh, lead deaf character uh, screams out her monologue at James Leeds, and it's such a shocking thing to hear her use her voice and she's so emotional, that just sears in your mind. Yeah. Uh, Sound of Metal is a, is a movie that I've, heard, I've seen deaf people say to me that it kind of like sears in your mind. And not only sears in the mind, but it, it tears a, a hole in your soul or your heart. So we based our theater company on that philosophy. And we did a lot of theater there. But I wanted, I wanted to also, we did Children of a Lesser God there. We did uh, so many things. Uh, but uh, one thing, uh, as a young man, I graduated from the University of Illinois, you know, uh, with my acting degree. I, I, I ended up, I, I started a lot of good that did me. What the fuck? Is, I, I go in there. I started out as a, doing as a one line at the beginning of a Romeo and Juliet about uh, one, it was one of the, uh, the centuries. It was talking about his, his pretty uh, sheath or bucket. What's that? I, I have something. Anyway, it's a stupid line. Of Shakespeare line. Got, you know, That's Shakespeare. Of, that will, that bill just, <laughs> And then hack. I fell in love with it. I had one line in that play. I fell in love with it. I, I can do this. And I graduated later at my last show. I ended up doing Mac the Night, the lead. I was, you know, in Three Penny Opera. So wow. I really, I, you know, uh, did the gamut. And then I, I sit down with my acting teacher, Bill Raffel. Yeah. In his office. I said, well, I, I started out here. I ended up here. I, I'm just going to burn this world down. I am Paul Racy. And I said, what's the next to me? What do you think? And Bill Raffel, he looks over across this little desk. He looks at me and he says, well, Paul, I don't know that you're going to have a lot of success right away. I'm like, what the, what? I don't want to hear this. Right. What do, you, what do you mean? He said, I don't think you're going to have a lot of big success until later on in life. I'm like, Thinking, oh, what, five years, 10? You don't mean 40 <laughs> years, did you, Bill? I didn't say that, but I'm thinking to myself, no, what? Now, I, you know, life, Bill just passed away last year. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, I, and one of the biggest things I wanted to do is, was let Bill know, because he made me fall in love with acting. He's the guy that I wanted to please him so much. I'm doing a monologue from Long Day's Journey in the Night, and he's looking at me like I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> I, I was in so much trouble. I, but you know, I would wear like a white T-shirt, like James Dean. I'd be like, you know, trying to be the James Dean in my class. Or, uh, and I, he said, I'll tell you what you do: go to Second City and study improv. So I did. I went to Second City. It's right around the corner, and I enrolled in a program there. I took two years of their program. You know. Like you, you can go to Groundlings, right. but I met a lot of great improvisational actors. I worked with a couple of improv groups 
in Chicago. I uh, did a lot of shows. I did a lot of improvisation in clubs like uh, like the Ground Rounds, like a hamburger joint. People are eating their food. Oh, I love Ground Rounds. Yeah, in Chicago, or Ground Round. And oh so, my God, for people who don't know, who aren't from Chicago, it was the best place where you can throw peanut shells on, on the floor, floor and popcorn. Exactly. Oh, so, love you're there, I'm there with, with a, a group of five, you know, two chicks, three guys in an improv group. And you know, and uh, on your suggestion of a lousy hamburger, we have give us a, we need a suggestion of whatever you know, and just desperately trying to make people laugh, just trying really hard. Uh, and so I did that. A lot of lot of lot of schwitzing, a lot of lot of sweat, uh, trying to make people laugh, and all kinds of uh, what do they call them um, industrial shows, making going to teachers conventions, making teachers laugh, going to a, a business meeting, making people laugh on, you know, you, you, you do research on the company and then you bring up the, well, Joe Blow said, ha, ha, you know, all that, so all that kind of work. But it did, I, I think the improvisational things at Second City did make me, I know it made me a better actor because when you're on, even, even in Sound of the Metal, years and years later after that, you know, there is, uh, if I didn't like the line that he wrote, uh, he was flexible, and he always said, "Look, you know, I'm not Shakespeare. And Shakespeare, you got to say every single syllable he wrote, or you're not in this club, okay?" Right. But uh, Darius was like, "Well, then say it the way you would say it, or add something else." And well, a lot of the stuff that I improv is in the final cut of the movie, you know. So uh, I do feel facile. I feel you know easy with talking uh, or making stuff up because sometimes you just have to. And we're doing this on film. Not digital, folks. It's on film. You get two or three takes. That's it. That's why, that's why the, the 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 movie is so beautiful. By the way, just gorgeous. Oh, gorgeous. Uh, uh, Jason Gaffney wants to know what is your dream acting job? Do you have a dream role? I just did it. I just. <laughs> It's going to be hard to top Joe. It really is. Except for the fact that people don't know Paul is so funny if you haven't caught on to that already. So I want to see you utilize your wicked sense of humor because you are a funny man. That would be good. I would like to do some comedy uh, to, to veer off of this stuff. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to uh, some serious, um, some serious work. I don't know what it is going to be yet, but uh, I've done, oh God, so much comedy. Uh, black. Oh. Comedy, Speaking you know. of comedy, you're setting us up perfectly because I want to share. We dug into the archives a little bit and found an old clip of you in Parks and Rec. Uh, it's short. It's 33 seconds. So uh, let's go back to the screening room, David, and let's show Paul, a young Paul Racy in Parks and Rec with Amy Poehler. Eugene. That was so good. You know what, though? I think because we've been in the theater, we need to discuss this um, in a better place. So I always ask my guests, where would you like to be if we could have any, if we could have a chat anywhere in the world? And Paul said, you know where I want to chat? I want to go have a conversation in a honky-tonk bar. So let's bring in some music and our honky-tonk bar, David. For we miss this <laughs> we miss being able to have good conversation with good friends in a bar my goodness so um Where everybody sticks their hands in the popcorn you know and not worries about <laughs> all that peanuts. maybe you can hug and kiss strangers yeah i hopefully i don't know if those days are ever coming back but we're here hanging with hillary they're back here now we can have our virtual popcorn so uh, is there anything you remember about filming that that you want to talk about? If not, we've got a whole bunch of questions in the oh. chat. Listen, let me tell you something. This is a good example of Hollywood. This is what they do. This, ha this happened many, many times. You get a, an audition like this, and they say, possible recurring character. And, of course, so here's this guy. He's uh, the, 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 he leads, he's the, the captain of the office or whatever, you know, the manager. And uh, what a great you see all the actors in that crew? That's a great, hilarious cast of characters. And I was hoping uh, that maybe there would have been some more work out of that. It would have been perfect. But no, you know, that, that doesn't happen. But listen, that's the kind of thing that you'll see. I can't tell you how many times. Possible recurring role. 
And so you get all excited about it. And I was excited about that because that was fun. Filmed right there in Griffith Park uh, in LA. Uh, a great feeling. Amy Poehler was hilarious. She's brilliant. They were having um, and you get to be part of their good time for a day or two. Um, that was a good one. I like that. I like that uh, that show. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot here and have you answer your next question. We're getting some requests from some of our deaf actors in the chat. Can you sign your next answer? Um, I will voice for you. Uh, hopefully, I will catch up and do you justice. But st- deaf actors would like to know uh, what it's like working with deaf actors compared to hearing actors or your experience working with deaf actors. So if you can do this in ASL and I'm going to try my best to keep up and voice for Paul. So Paul saying right now, let's see, working with deaf actors is just the best champ, you know, because really it's like, you know, it's rare because every once in a while I have this chance to work with a deaf actor you know, so really, you know, on Sound of Metal, the film I just did, I got to interact and perform with lots of different deaf actors. And it was fun. And really, it was like, you know, a deaf club, right? We all were together. So and when we got to play and rock out. Improv. Improv. Rock oh. out on the improv. It was really awesome. It was very cool. Champ. So thank you for that. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can feel some smiles coming through the screen thing. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to go to another question. Uh, it's a related question. Uh, Giselle Castillo wants to know, what was it like What's it like being a CODA, growing up with deaf parents, being a hearing person? And I know that's like years worth of conversation, but if you could summarize your experience for people who aren't familiar with that. I think uh, it's different now than it was back in the 50s. You have to understand, I'm growing up in the 50s in Chicago. There's no captioning. There's no texting. There's none of the stuff that you guys have today. My mother... Uh, was deaf and she had, you know, she was trying to be independent. And of course, uh, she had to lean on me, the oldest child, a lot. So my earliest remembrance is uh, she couldn't pay the electric bill one time. And I had to get on the phone and kind of negotiate with this lady on the phone. Could you please not turn off the lights or the gas uh, for about, because we're going to be late on this bill. So I was always negotiating with the hearing world and feeling the pressure of, uh, of that. Today, it's not that way. You know, if my father had a ticket, either his hearing uh, brother, his uncle had to go with him to the courthouse or I had to go with him. Somebody had to facilitate some kind of communication. The court wasn't going to take care of it. Uh, so deaf, so my remembrance of deaf people at the time was just that they were just really overly oppressed uh, and not even thought of, you know, the same thing as um, who would ever think to put uh a wheelchair ramp in a courthouse or to make sidewalks accessible so people could use them that have wheelchairs. That was never even thought of. Um, and so the awareness of our society just seemed to grow. So my experience growing up as a CODA is different than the one today. Today, they got CODA camps. These kids, they go to, they go to these camps and they get pumped up with who they are and be proud of themselves and CODAs run it. And oh my God, my, and, uh, you know, I'm not being a crybaby about this, but listen, when I was a kid, it was like, this is my secret. This is my secret little club. Right. And nobody knew that I knew the secret language. And I didn't want to really talk about it to anybody because, you know, those are still the days when I still remember people making fun of my parents. We'd go to wow. a, a McDonald's. A stupid little McDonald's adventure turns into this odyssey of misunderstanding and and trying to negotiate for hamburgers and french fries, and, you know, come on. So it's a little bit different. So did I, and listen, uh, American Sign Language is my native tongue, it's my first language. And I was brought up in deaf culture. I was brought up by a, a, a group of wonderful, beautiful human beings who happen to be deaf in Chicago. I had a lot of deaf aunts and uncles that taught me what it is to love 
what it is to fight for your rights. I learned that as a young, young boy. So uh, my feeling toward the hearing world wasn't exactly rosy, okay? I, I did not, I felt a little bit protective of my, of my dad and his friends because I could see that their attitudes toward hearing people was not exactly rosy. And I say that with all due love and respect to the hearing people that I know, but I, you have to understand what it's like to, to, uh, to live in a world where you're isolated from your own pop culture. It's not even your pop culture because you don't have access to it. You right. don't have to a show like Bonanza. All you know is there's these, these cowboys riding around on horses and whatever else the story was about, who the hell knows? Nobody knows. <laughs> So there I am sitting next to the TV interpreting, you know, Pa and Adam and Hoss and little Joe and oh not saying the Asian cook. I'm doing all four of these characters. Saying, That's pretty cool. My dad, my dad think now he gets the story though. Come on. But no wonder you're an actor. You got your experience <laughs> putting all these characters on and off. What talking about Bonanza. You know what show I'm talking about? Is everybody too old to remember Bonanza? We got a young crowd. We've got, we've, uh, I don't know. I don't see that in, in the chat. Any, anybody who loves Bonanza. It was number chatted. one for like 10 years. It was crazy. We well, got some people who were not born for many, many, many years after Bonanza. Even enough to say that I used to interpret <laughs> television shows from my dad so he could get. Otherwise, he's sitting there watching the TV screen and I'm thinking to myself, I said, do you know what they're saying? He goes, no, I'm just making it up in my head. <laughs> Making up his own script. And so I would do the script for him and go, oh, okay, okay. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. So we've got a question from Malik Malik, who uh, you were talking about how growing up, uh, having to interpret for your folks. And now that you're a court interpreter, Malik Malik wants to know that uh, what can the courts do to improve accessibility now? Is there anything now or anything in general that you can see that can improve uh, to make the world, the courts, or anything else more accessible to deaf people? Um, they're, they're pretty much, uh, they have to, listen, the courts don't know anything about interpreting. They don't know shit about that. Hmm. Uh, they don't know anything unless the interpreters inform them of what they need. So if I need a, a certified deaf interpreter, I let the court know, I let the judge know, this ain't working. And so here's what we gotta do. And they follow what an interpreter says. Now, the administrations of the courts, those are the ones you want to wring around the neck because they, they don't give a crap about deaf people. The judges do. The judges care about um, justice. That's what kills me about this whole Trump thing, him talking about Republican and Democrat judges. You know, my experience has been in the court system. I never met a Republican or a Democrat judge in my life when it comes to uh, rape trials and murder trials and anything right. else. They care about justice as proven as to what's going on right now with this country. His own appointed judges had to turn him down because they care about justice. I never saw a Republican judge or a Democrat judge. They're just so, judges. They're just judges. And they follow the law. Now, now the administration, for example, the administration, the ones that, that, that hire the interpreters, like the ones in Los Angeles administration, I gotta tell you, they got a lot to learn. You have to listen to your certified interpreters that have been doing this for years and I'll tell you what they need and the judges are doing that. So um, what can we do to improve that? Deaf people themselves have the power to improve it. If you feel you've been done wrong, all you have to do is let them know, make your complaints known to the interpreting office and the administration that, that provides this access for you. Let them know. They listen to you. They don't like being sued. They don't like being threatened. They don't like that. They want things to go smoothly. And they want to they want to brag to the world that they've got the best uh, system. Well, if, you, if you've been wrong, I don't care where it is, Los Angeles County, Kern County, let them know. If you're not satisfied with the interpreting that I do or anybody else does, complain about it. Let them know. Uh, exercise your right to be heard. The deaf people really have a lot to say about it. And don't think you don't, because I've seen it happen over and over again. 
somebody speaks up and they go, oh, you know, deaf people were never allowed to be on juries. And this guy, uh, when I first moved here in 1990, a deaf man, I don't know his name, I forgot, he sued Los Angeles County. Guess what? Since that point, deaf people have been on juries. Now, a lot of deaf people aren't happy about that. <laughs> you got to come serve your time with everyone else. You get an interpreter, though, so. Some deaf people are more than happy to do it. And I've, they, they're more than happy to exercise that right for whatever reason. And a lot of deaf people that I've been an interpreter for in trials where you have to go in the back in the jury room for the deliberations and interpret all that stuff. Of course, there's two of you back there, two interpreters, and you go back and forth. I've, I've seen some deaf people have extremely beneficial experiences being a deaf juror. And they're thrilled to death that they were involved in the justice system. So that's, that's when, uh, that means everything to me. That means everything to me, access. So Paul, besides, I, I love the fact that besides being a, a fabulous actor, musician, interpreter, that you're also an advocate, an ally to empower, not just uh, the deaf community and interpreters, but um, also for young actors. And I know you and I have talked a lot about how you meant, you've met, you mentored a lot of the younger actors on set that even the character of Joe, who was mentoring Ruben and his journey, and that sort of uh, mirrored what you personally did for Riz, that your uh, acting roles uh, can you can you talk a little bit about that? How life sort of bled into art? Well, I, I don't know if I uh, mentored him, but in a way, uh, I was trying to be. Well, we were getting to know each other. Riz, I, the only reason I say that because Riz is such a powerful actor. Oh, he's amazing. He is amazing. amazing. He is intense. I love that guy. He's so good. Very intelligent actor. But uh, like I said, when I first got there on the first day, I didn't know the guy. But I had brought with me, for example, I used to run a, uh, a min an addiction ministry uh, with, uh, at the Agape International Spiritual Center here in Los Angeles. One of my spiritual teachers, Michael Beckwith, where I learned a lot of how I believe today from, um, I had gone through his program as a practitioner at his spiritual center. And I had this big freaking notebook of things, little sayings from uh, Gandhi or this program or that program or just simple AA things out of the, the out of the book, the big book. And uh, I had brought all this information with me to Boston. So every day, uh, rather than talk with Riz about how are we going to do this scene or whatever, we didn't do a lot of that. Right. A lot of it was just, I, I couldn't believe it. it was so real. I would just hand him a card and I'd say, you know, here's here or here's an article about addiction. Here's just something for you to think about today. I do that first thing in the morning. And he looked at me, he took it, and he goes, thank you, and he put it in his pocket. I did that every day. Wow. So along, along the way, uh, I would just hand them one little note. Sometimes it would be just one word, you know. Uh, and even the day when I, when I gave him that writing assignment, God, every single day, I'd give him something. And I just had it all planned out, and I, and I had so much material. Uh, so that was just one of the things that I did to make that, you know, that off when you're on set, it's one thing, but offset, I just wanted to give them that to think about. So that was just, that's kind of a method. That I was going to ask you, do you consider yourself a method actor or is that uh, just one of your bag of tricks? It's a, it, I would say both. I have always thought about method as being my way because, uh, well, as early back as the university, uh, when I started learning about Stanislavski, uh, that was where it all began from. Like, wow, you can actually build a character. You know, how how to build a character. Uh, the uh, the actor prepares. I loved that shit. I loved learning about how Stanislavski took a group of actors and you 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 lived together and ate together. You know, when we when we came out there to Boston or Ipswich, where that house is, I I heard Darius musing to himself. Darius is, is <laughs> so wonderful. He's a young guy, but he's like musing, but, oh, you know, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all live in this house for real? Uh, no, I, yeah. I, and yeah, but it wasn't even hooked up with the real electricity so we could live there. 
<laughs> and the crew's like, no, we don't want to go home oh, to our so, own bed. Well, it was soon, but it was so romantic because, you know, for me, you know, uh, I don't know if you know anything about, about Aerosmith, the hard rock band. You know, David, when they did Toys in the Attic, their second album, I believe, they all got together and lived in a house, you know? Right. Uh, and the house, uh, they lived in that house and they wrote that album in the house together and lived together like buddies, or, you know. And when he mentioned that, I thought, God, that's so romantic. Right. And, and But it would be a cool thing to do. You could accomplish so much by living together. Oh, yeah. Great. But we still, uh, we still got to, you know, uh, we still got to workshop things together. We, we, right. we did little things together that made us feel, that bonded us in that house. So anyway, um, I forgot why you asked me that, what I why I'm answering the question. I, I, I'm just on that journey with you. yeah because you're right in being in a creative bubble whether yeah, like yeah. coming from a theater background that you're you've got a rehearsal process that you're bonded that way and you're right if you're lucky enough to have a director like Darius that puts you all together and it's not just okay you're called to set and you have blocking and a rehearsal and then you go but you really are living these experiences to be immersed and you know as a creative person who likes to play and really get to feel each other out i could i could just imagine how extraordinary that was to be fully immersed and was, to to bring your own experiences to that it was, it was a great yeah a, late, a great little uh, time of creativity just just really great and you know uh, after our last scene, we had dinner that night, Riz and I and Darius and Sasha, one of the producers. And uh, I really appreciate Riz. Uh, he really paid me a big compliment. He just said, you know, there's something to be said about uh, the, the, I, I can't, he just paid me a compliment saying, you know, older actors really should be respected. Uh, I, I just felt like he, he was feeling me and all the, everything I tried to do to uh, bring uh, life to to both of us and and he fed me so, i i always say uh i'm grateful for riz breaking my heart in that last scene oh, so wow sorry. that he broke my heart because i love that guy so um it was a great great experience well if you had to give one piece of advice to any young actors watching right now who are just starting out what what advice would you give to them well uh, you know I uh, I can't. Uh, I would I would tell them you're probably not going to be successful in, in your for forty years until Darius Martyr writes a role for them. <laughs> uh, you know, if you really think you're an actor, if you really are, you know, writers. Yeah, I don't consider myself a writer. Uh, I've got a lot of ideas, and I I uh, I improv and I I um, collaborate. I collaborate with my band, and I collaborate. With a, with a writer when I have something to say. If you're a writer, you write every day. If you're an actor, if you're a musician, you play every day. If you sing, you gotta sing every day. If you're an actor, then you have to try to act every day. Yeah, you can't sit by the pool with your cell phone going, I don't know, wonder where they're gonna call me here, you know, it ain't gonna happen here. You practice your craft. Practice your craft. Right. Get a day job so that you can live here. You gotta, you gotta survive here in Los Angeles. If that's where you're gonna live, or if you're going to be an actor in Austin, Texas, which is a great place to be an actor right now, in my opinion, mm -hmm. then find a way to survive there and try to act every day. Get into a group of actors. So you have to do it every day and you can't stop. And you're going to get, and no, you know, you're going to get rejected over and over and over. You're going to get flicked, flicked, flicked. Rejection is your way oh. of life. Speaking of which, uh, I think this discussion, we need to continue on to a more appropriate location, talking about things that aren't working out. Things hell? That, Why the hell? <laughs> uh, close. It's, it's the in-between. So, David, let's take us to the graveyard. Mm. And the music. Cue the spooky music. <laughs> so, but you... If we were talking that, you know, there's so many projects that you start as an artist, things you write, uh, shows you audition for that you don't get cast and you're okay. like, it's dead. You know, this project is never going to work. But sometimes like that hand rising up behind you, 
uh, that you've got zombies that, that resurrect into a second life. So I know you've got a project that you were working on for many years that is still a work in progress. And I think this is a good place to talk about it. So um, can you tell us a little bit about Deaf Ghost? Oh, yeah, Deaf Ghost. Now, look, as I said, every uh, gas station attendant and a 7-Eleven guy that works there is working on a script because if you're in Hollywood, you're here, here to be an actor. So you're right. writing a so when I moved here, I started writing a script about, uh, let's see, a coda, uh, a guy that knows sign language, and his deaf mother who uh, dies, and she comes back as a ghost, and um, she needs her son to interpret for her, okay? I was writing that with several writing partners that I've had. A serious feature film, uh, and I was going to have a bunch of deaf people in it, and that was, and then... You know, it went it went round and round, almost got it made, going from this producer to that producer, people wanting to do it, but I wasn't a big enough name. I wasn't a big enough name. At one point, they wanted to get Tom Cruise to play my part. Was, you so wrote for yourself, right? I fought for myself, never got it accomplished, and now that all this shit hit the fan and everything's over, because Darius Martyr, when Darius Martyr wrote this script and sent it to me, uh, I, I took my, uh, what's that program uh, that you write your scripts on? Uh, final draft? Final draft. I took my final draft and smashed it against them. <laughs> no, Whoa. there are people who really want that program. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, that hurts my heart. But I get it. I get it. It's so frustrating when you, you're right. You spend so much time and energy and something well, doesn't pan I, out. Exactly. But this was kind of the perfect role that I was trying to, that the, the, you know, when you pray for something, when you pray or you spiritually set your mind uh, and meditate on something, the feeling tone of what I was uh, trying to attract to myself was the feeling tone of Sound of Metal. That's what mm -hmm. I was trying to do with Ghost. So now that this has happened and people are asking me about, because everybody always thinks that was such a great idea. Obviously it wasn't. However, now I'm thinking about making Deaf Ghost into a comedy. Why not make Deaf Ghost into a half an hour comedy like the Ghost of Mrs. Muir where she comes back and, you know, so I'm going to re re rework that idea. Uh, I've got a lot of things in the hopper going on uh, for some things in the future. But um, so maybe with that perspective of now that this experience has turned out to be the way it is, maybe I'll take Deaf Ghost to make it into a, a comedy, which sounds like the way to go right now. Uh, right. So we'll see what happens with that. But there's a lot of things happening. This pandemic is if you're if you're a young actor and you listen, you gotta find a way to be creative now because when this thing is over, things are going to explode. You yeah. do not want to be left behind. If you've got projects, get them in order right now. Because, you know, as I heard one guy say, uh, this uh, guy predicting, he's saying and it could be 2023, 24. It's going to be like the 1920s, he said, where people are going to be having promiscuous sex. People are going to be writing all kinds of different comedy. The, the, the rock bars are going to explode. And so I, I'm being funny, but I'm telling you right now, if you, you better get your ducks in line right now, because when it explodes, it's going to. That's why I'm not worried about it right now. I'm hanging, I'm hanging you know, with Hillary. I'm hanging low. Uh, things are going to, things are moving. Uh, and they're going to move fast. I got my first vaccine last Saturday. I got my next up. So let's all get ready for it and think think positive. I think it's going to, it is going to explode. Well, like we've been talking about that a lot. Uh, for my clubhouse peeps that are on right now watching, thank you. We've been talking about collaborating and making things now you don't even have to wait grab your cameras produce things grab a writer friend grab a producer friend and you can do things on a smaller scale independently you got a whole studio you can release your films on youtube you can monetize your films you do not need to wait for anyone to give you permission to act to write to make things because right now we all carry around a little movie studio in our pocket and so, yeah, you can talk to, um, message me if you need ideas, or you can keep hanging with Hillary. We're going to have guests on for many, many more weeks to come to, uh, to hopefully 
provide some inspiration. And I mean, this show, I really put it about because it's about the journey. I mean, I love my friends. I love Paul and I love David and all the people who've been on the show so far and the others we've got lined up because it shows of really making a life as an artist, an actor, a singer, a musician, composer, and enjoying the journey and being creative and trying to come up with your own things because it's it's not always easy to get cast or get hired. You have, like they said, if you build it, they will come. Listen. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that, David. <laughs> Listen, it's, uh, it's not for the faint of heart, this acting thing. But if you think you're an actor, uh, everything is a practice. Spirituality, if you have a spiritual practice, that if you, you've, you've got to practice being positive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard. It's, listen, it's not, hard, it's not easy for me. Uh, I, I'll admit that. Um, it's kind of like a ping pong game. You know, it's going back and forth. You're, I'm happy, I'm sad. I'm happy, I'm sad. I'm positive, negative, positive, negative. Blah, 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 blah. But you've got, and it just, until it, it you've got to get it so that it, it, it kind of like uh, gets to where Joe talks about that stillness. And even if it's uh, five seconds, it, it's it's totally beneficial. You just have to develop your spiritual practice, your uh, positive practice, your acting practice. Mm -hmm. It is a craft, and you have to develop it. So don't waste time just because it's a pandemic now, and you don't think you've oh nothing's happening. Something's happening because you're breathing, ain't you? <laughs> you're breathing. Do something. You know. True. Well, you've got a bunch of fans here in the chat, uh, including Malik Malik said, many people will be more than happy to crowdfund your next movie, Paul, including me. So hit up Malik Malik, who's funding your next film. <laughs> Thank you, Malik Malik. <laughs> uh, all right. So we've got a couple more moments for some questions, but I am so happy. We actually have a moment uh, to show if you haven't seen it already, Paul did a special project for Sound of Metal where he signed the song um, from from uh, the sound the Metallica song "Enter the Sandman," and you will get to see this cover being done. But you'll get to see Paul's beautiful signing. So think of your questions because when we come back from that clip, I'll have time to answer maybe one more question in the chat. So um, hang in there. We're gonna, let's go back to the screening, David, and let's show a little bit of Enter the Sound Man by Metallica and Sound of Metal. My gosh, we need a crowd cheer for that, David. Let's bring oh, in our oh, crowd. Oh. Yes. You know, whenever it's 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 not a new trend, but it's something I, I'm I'm more aware of because you see clips on the internet all the time. Now it's at heavy metal concerts; they'll have a signer, and yeah. everyone there, hearing, deaf, young, old, is like. That's the coolest person at the show because I don't know, you know, this, this is a new world to me, but I've learned that it's not just what your hands are doing. It's your whole body. It's your face. It's your, it's your everything. So they're to do it right. They have to rock out. So, so the, the interpreter is just totally rocking out and everyone at the concert is like, you know, that person. <laughs> and they're, they're working so hard. You don't realize that they have to, They've got to get themselves up with the music. They've got to study the music. They've got to think of what, what the interpretation is going to look like. It's a lot of work. Just it's like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's amazing. And it's glorious. 
Yeah, but right. one of the things that has been a discussion in the deaf communities, these interpreters get a lot of focus, like you said, a lot of attention. But instead, it's like, let's interview some of the deaf concert goers and throw some light spotlight onto the deaf people in the audience. Like, that's like complimenting someone's wheelchair and being like, look at all the sparkly spokes. It's like, hi, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the person in the chair or, you know, complimenting someone's ramp or guide dog but it's it's those are things to make the concerts accessible so you know uh trying to be a good ally and trying to toss that spotlight you know back to the deaf consumers who are there and enjoying the show and probably have really interesting opinions of what they think of the music and the show and the experience oh yeah that's probably the more interesting question because when when my band when we do uh, our gigs I've got a heavy metal Black Sabbath band. We do our gigs and, you know, 40 deaf people show up in, in a headbanging nightclub, okay? Amazing. At the ages of, you know, 21, some younger, but at the age of 21, all the way up to the age of 60. So 40 people with that age range coming in and hearing people who have never seen a deaf person in their life are going, what the? <laughs> These people rocking out. What is the? What is not, yeah, well, of course, they don't know. There's so many different levels of deafness. Some people can hear a little bit. Some can't hear anything. They love the vibration. They want to party. Rock and roll is cool. I don't understand. You know, so uh, it's a big um, awareness boost for a lot of people that didn't expect to get an awareness boost, boost, boost coming to a, a heavy metal club. <laughs> Well, with Black well, Sabbath, you could feel the rhythm in the floorboards. I mean, it, it, you know, you oh. could you could feel it not just beating in your chest, but you could feel it through the, in the air. I mean, you know, you could feel the, well, the pulsing guys, rhythm. We our guys used both our guitarists, our lead guitarist and our bass guitar. They have Marshall stacks. We use we use they we specifically use Marshall stacks on the stage so that you will feel it. Uh, that's that you do feel it. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> we are not messing around. <laughs> You can't Not with messing Black with Sabbath. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of accessibility, there I see my squad here in the chat. Um, that there are a bunch of deaf filmmakers that have been showing up on Clubhouse, and we are doing something really unusual this coming Saturday, February thirteenth at. 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We are going to live stream our Clubhouse uh, room live on. Facebook. Um, okay. I don't have the link to stick in the chat, but with an assigned language interpreter, so the deaf community can participate in this audio only app called Clubhouse because we want to pull in the signing deaf community to have access. A wild experiment. I, I apologize. I will throw the link up uh, on this video after we close out for all that. But, you know, it's we're trying to make this world more accessible, more inclusive, and more diverse. So, I'm up for that. That's what we're yeah. trying to do. All right. Well, we are about out of time. Paul, I am so happy you joined us. How can how can people follow you, support you, find you? <laughs> it's like show up at my house. <laughs> my wife will greet you at the door. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you know, you can follow me. Uh, I'm I'm on Twitter. Uh I think I'm on uh you're on Instagram. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. And you actually showed, taught me how to do some Instagram stuff, which I'm eternally grateful because I love Instagram. I just, I'm trying to get more into it. But no, uh, follow me. Love me from afar. Uh, come, listen, I, I would hope, I just love if my deaf peeps could come to Petey's place in Tarzana. And the, the next time we play, their hands of doom. Check it out when this thing's over, hopefully. I love to see my deaf peeps come and, and check out the band because you will have a good time. It's a big party. But uh, I'm enjoying the love right now. Um, I'm grateful to everybody who uh, is, is enjoying the movie, enjoying the, the work that I did. And uh, I'm, I couldn't be more, I, I never could have dreamed in a thousand years that uh, I'd be on Hanging with Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> It's everyone's dream come true, Paul. I am beyond honored. You deserve every accolade and then some, and I am deeply grateful you're here. Please subscribe to Hanging with Hillary.
you can follow me wherever I am with my uh, wackadoodle spelling of my name. But Paul, I love and adore you. Thank you so much for being here and hanging with me. Pleasure, my pleasure. Love you very much, David. You're 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 hilarious. Love you, man. You David, rock, man. my fabulous awesome. co-host. I am so grateful for you, my sidekick, my right hand man, who's working all this magic. And please check David out on his Twitch. Um, he has a fabulous show playing guitar. And if you want to know how to do these fancy graphics, you can go to Let's Do Video. It's in the chat with the link, and he will show you how you can make your own magic. But until then, thank you so much for hanging with Hillary. I love you all. Uh, peace out. Come on, Dee Dee. Off we go. Thank you for hanging with Hillary, and we'll see you next week. Come on, Dee Dee. We've got places to go. we got things to do.